live. Hello, hello. Welcome to this week's uh, virtual seminar. Um, my name is Phil Armstrong, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, J.R. McMillan, who has worked as a postdoctoral scientist here at the Ag Station since 2018, and he'd like to uh, share his uh, latest findings on the efficacy of mosquito larval control for the prevention of West Nile virus. Um, by way of introduction, I just want to give you a little background about JR. He uh, comes from the great straight state of Georgia, uh, where he received his bachelor's degree in ecology from University of Georgia. He then spent a number of years working as a lab manager at Emory University before um, enter, enter, entering the PhD program there in population biology, ecology, and evolution. Uh, received his PhD in 2018, and we were very fortunate to snap him up and to bring him uh, on board uh, to um, work here at the experiment station. Uh, for a long time, he's been working um, focused on the biology ecology of urban mosquito vectors of West Nile virus. And his, um, that included for his PhD, he worked on the field ecology and control of these mosquitoes and West Nile virus. And he's still been working in the same vein. Um, he's been very successful here. He's already published uh, three papers uh, as a part of his postdoctoral work. He has two first author papers on the community ecology of mosquitoes and uh, their viruses. And he also has a, a co-authored paper on the uh, insecticide resistance in field populations of mosquitoes. And he has a number of other papers in the pipeline, one of them which he's going to talk about today. Um, the title today's talk, Mosquito Larval Control for the Prevention of West Nile Virus, Is It Enough? So with that, I uh, give you JR and um, uh, I'll switch mics over to him. So there, JR? Yeah. I'm here. Thanks so much, Phil, for that introduction and for CAES and the, the employment opportunity here, the research opportunities here, the friendship opportunities, and just the, um, especially today, the opportunity to actually share my work. I've been sort of waiting for the opportunity to present at one of these lunch meetings. So even if it's virtual, I'm happy to do it. So the title of my talk today is Mosquito Larval Control for the Prevention of West Nile Virus. And I sort of through that isn't enough question in there in the beginning to sort of get us thinking critically about what it is as a nation, as a region, as a state, and as you know a local municipality, how we approach uh, mosquito control for a virus such as West Nile virus. So before I begin, I just want to thank everyone who's been involved in my research life. Uh, a lot of uh, field surveillance for mosquitoes and viruses and wildlife, even you know making models or doing experiments takes a lot of help. And so there's been a lot of undergrads, a lot of volunteers, a lot of graduate students, a lot of friends, mentors that have all uh, contributed to my success in some ways. And without them, I truly wouldn't have been able to have been as successful as Phil thinks I am. So the outline of my talk today, I've sort of broken it into four sections. Um, the first is an extremely sort of brief intro into a historical perspective of mosquito control and the current state of mosquito control in the U.S. and um, zooming in on Connecticut with the arboviruses that are under surveillance by CAES. The second part is that we'll walk through what the guidelines of the U.S. Um, specifically from CDC for the prevention of West Nile virus um, exposure in, in humans. And then the third part of the talk is really the meat and potatoes of this. This is my own research, um, both at Emory and here. And I'll sort of wrap it up with just some applied outcomes of the work from CT and some um, future work that I would hope to do in my career. So we'll begin with our very, very short history lesson. So really the foundational knowledge of mosquito biology, ecology, genomics, control, whatever you want to call it, it really begins with malaria. And this is really the first pathogen that was fully described um, in its transmission between mosquitoes and humans. And we're all 
I'm sure very familiar with malaria and the scourge that it's been to, in human history. Um, and so with that discovery that malaria was a mosquito-borne disease came the global effort to eradicate malaria. And so it really truly was a global effort. Um, you could consider it a top-down militaristic approach, but it applied a lot of um, techniques and methods and control aspects to really get um, human transmission, you know, down to eradicate it. Um, here, and, and these are sort of images I've acquired from Wikimedia that are sort of all in the uh, public domain. Here we have, you can sort of see it right here, an airplane um, applying Paris Green, which is um, probably the first uh, insecticide ever developed for mosquito control. Um, here you have a drainage project somewhere in Arkansas. Um, you can see all of the, the manpower that went into sort of transforming this landscape to make it no longer hospitable to malaria transmitting um, vectors. Here we have larval surveillance, and you'll notice that these gentlemen are in combat fatigue. So that's part of this top-down approach. A lot of the um, action that went into malaria control involved the military um, and sort of public health military type things. So out there looking for viruses, for the mosquitoes looking for the place to treat them. The history of malaria is um, intertwined with the history of DDT, which we I'm sure are all familiar with as well. And then also because malaria is a human pathogen, there are actual specific medications for it that can help both alleviate symptoms of the pathogen in humans and eradicate it. So it's really this all out effort that can go into malaria control. And malaria used to be in the United States and through a number of these methods um, and socioeconomic changes, you know, it's not a problem anymore. Now, what we face as sort of mosquito-borne threats in the United States are really these more zoonotic um, pathogens. So these are um, more wildlife diseases like Lyme disease, West Nile virus. They're transmitted between um, mosquitoes or ticks and members and wildlife and humans sort of get randomly exposed to this, um, to these viruses. It's really an accident of exposure. Um, and this sort of this accident depends on where, when, and what you're exposed to, but there can be very severe consequences to being exposed to these, um, these pat wildlife pathogens. And so not only with the different ecologies of these pathogens comes different um, aspects of mosquito control for them. So to think about West Nile virus specifically, you know, we're really sort of, it's the biggest thing to think about is, you know, malaria was more of this rural exurban type um, pathogen, but that's not really what our, you know, society looks like anymore. Most people live in cities and something like West Nile virus is much more common in cities. So you just can't go, the landscape has already changed. You can't necessarily make massive natural changes to an environment to control these vectors. You know, we're looking more at um, the application of insecticides in discrete, you know, sort of containers. You know, we're trying to identify places where there are larvae and treat them um, individually rather than broad scale applications of insecticides, say, from an airplane. We have public health messaging, so trying to notify the public of where viruses might be, when they're most active, um, things like that. And then finally, we are sort of limited in our approach where there are only general treatments for a number of these pathogens. So West Nile virus, there is no vaccine. There is no standard um, specific antigen course of treatment or what you will in a hospital to treat someone who gets this infected. So really what we're facing in the United States right now is much different than the historical foundation. Uh, and indeed, West Nile virus is sort of emblematic of really the primary um, wildlife uh, human hazards in Connecticut. All of the viruses under surveillance uh, by CAES are zoonotic, meaning they exist in some non-human wild animal and mosquito cycle. Um, and like West Nile virus, occasionally exposure to these pathogens can be quite severe. So just to sort of briefly highlight some of the ecology work I've done in a slide or two about this is really the primary vector threats of mosquitoes in Connecticut are really eastern equine encephalitis, um, which is a pathogen transmitted by this mosquito here, Culocetamilinura. 
Um, what we have here is the epidemic curve of isolates in Melanura, colored here in sort of aquamarine. So you can see that most of the, and this is time, and this is about you know, late July into October, really the greatest risk of triple E is in late summer. And you can sort of see these red dots here, and it's tough to see at the scale, but these are all the surveillance sites in Connecticut. And these red dots are all the high risk areas for um, Eastern equine encephalitis. So you can see this, they sort of aggregate together in space. And you see similar patterns with West Nile virus, but in sort of different places. So it's transmitted by different species. Um, you can see that this species here in dark blue, Culex pipiens, it's really more of a full summer risk of exposure um, based on viral activity in the species in the state. And then these red dots, if you can imagine it, this is I-95-91 going up through the state. So really, as we know, West Nile virus is a very urban um, disease here in Connecticut. And these are where they are. To highlight how this looks different from other viruses in the state, here are just sort of two um, mammalian arboviruses. So these primarily differ from West Nile virus in their main hosts. So West Nile virus and Triple E are transmitted among birds, whereas Z viruses are transmitted among mammals, mainly deer. Um, and their sort of epidemic curves and risk maps also look a lot different. So what the main thing to take away from these sort of epi plots right here that show you how many viral isolates come from a different species is just the colors. So there's a lot more colors in the mammalian arboviruses, meaning that there's more species that seem to be important to its transmission cycle. You also, in these maps, see a lot less red. So risk of these viruses is really more diffuse across the landscape. There's really no one particular type of habitat that stands out more than another. And these have very important implications for not only how we understand the ecology and epidemiology of these viruses, but also how we implement surveillance programs and mosquito control strategies. And to some degree, we have sort of a benefit with the um, avian arboviruses, Tripoli and West Nile virus. You can see we continue the same theme here of using colors. The avian ar arboviruses are a lot less colorful and a lot more uniform in terms of what vectors are really driving risk. And so these are really the diseases I've been focused on in my research um, as we move forward in the talk. So since West Nile virus is the focus of my research, what is the national strategy for the control and prevention of this virus? And briefly, I'll just take a break here to get some water. And if anyone has any brief questions, um, I can try and field those. Um, okay, well, I'll keep moving on. So, because I said before, there is no vaccine for any of the mosquito viruses that are a threat to human health in Connecticut. We implement a um, integrated mosquito management strategy for the control of West Nile virus. So, really, all of our um, efforts to prevent human exposure to these pathogens are based on attacking the mosquito and preventing interactions between mosquitoes and humans. So by an integrated um, management system, what I mean is that you can't rely on just one method to impact the disease. You have to use a variety of methods that reduce uh, mosquito populations, improve human health and enjoyment of the environment, and um, decrease the chances for mosquitoes, infected mosquitoes, to come into contact with humans. So this includes eliminating, eliminating breeding habitats, reducing populations, interrupting contacts, blah, blah, blah. So for West Nile virus and other zoonotic diseases, what are we really talking about? Well, in terms of reducing larvae, um, we're looking at two, two strategies. One is source removal. So this is actually eliminating the habitat outright. So for thinking about mosquitoes that breed in tires, you know, tire dumps, uh, abandoned swimming pools, um, flooded areas, you know, this is really, this is getting rid of the water so that there are no opportunities for mosquitoes to lay their eggs and develop as larvae. The other strategy is source reduction. So you can't remove the water source, but you can treat it. You can do something to the water that makes it inhospitable to mosquitoes. So a primary example of this is applying a 
insecticide to the water. So this is what's called a mosquito dunk that you throw in the water and it sort of um, elicits a toxin slowly through time and kills any mosquitoes that show up. The next part of our integrated mosquito management program is implementing personal protection. You know, wearing your bug um, spray, wearing light colored long sleeve clothing in summer to prevent mosquitoes from biting. Uh, EPA, this is just a screenshot from EPA giving all sorts of different resources about um, repellents to use and things like that. The next thing is modifying human habitat. So somehow modify your space so that mosquitoes can't enter it. Those are things like screening your windows. Um, it's not very prevalent here in Connecticut, but in Georgia where I'm from, a lot of people have air conditioning. So there's really no interaction. Um, you know, there's never windows open and houses in the South. So that's one um, example of a modified human habitat. So the big one, it's often what we think about because of malaria history is reducing adult populations. So these are spraying chemicals into the environments that kill or repel mosquitoes. You can do this at sort of a, a homeowner level. So this is something you buy and attach to your hose and sort of spray it in your yard. And we're also sort of thinking of the historical context of someone with some sort of machine fogging an area or an airplane or a helicopter spraying it over large areas. Um, and then finally in this strategy, you know, we have um, our public health outreach, you know, inform the public of risk, give them the tools to know how to protect themselves and how to prevent mosquitoes breeding on their property. So again, as before, as we've honed in on West Nile virus in this literature, we're also going to hone in on this aspect of larval source management as really what the primary focus of my research in this area has been. So as I said, this is sort of these are sort of very brief um, introductions. Um, we're all sort of, you know, we're building to the point now where we're discussing what I've done before I came here and what I've been doing since. So to check to see if anyone's paying attention, um, it's not just eating pizza. I have a little quiz for the audience. Um, everyone in the mosquito labs don't um, give away the answer, but so the question is, what mosquito control method or methods have been shown to reduce the incidence of West Nile virus in humans? So I'm not looking for anecdotal evidence. I'm looking for what is a published factual account of something that has um, reduced transmission and infection in humans. So is it public health messaging, fixing infrastructure? So things like roads and dams, um, large, so control on private property, aerial applications of insecticides, any of them or, or none of them. I don't really know how to check the chat, but you guys are welcome to sort of briefly just send in any ideas you have while I take just a short water break? If anyone's brave enough, they can turn on their microphone and take a guess. All right. Well, regardless of what you have been thinking or wanting to submit or answer, the answer is aerial applications of adulticides. So this is actually the only form of mosquito control for West Nile virus that has been shown to reduce the number of cases of West Nile virus. Um, and even this information is pretty limited. There's very few papers that actually show this effect. And then there's plenty of other papers that have been unable to show this effect. Um, and part of the reason why it's been so hard to show these effects is that um, an application like this, it would be considered reactive. You know, spraying insecticides from an airplane takes money, it takes time, it takes coordination. You know, so there has to be a really big reason to do it. And so typically something like this is not implemented until some sort of threshold of hospital cases has shown up. And so any sort of evaluation of this um, method is always looking back in time. It's looking at, well, what was it before we sprayed and what was it after we sprayed? And that can be very hard to sort of show an effect. And to be honest, there's really, you know, something like this hasn't happened that often. Um, and in general, there isn't really a lot of research on 
if what we're doing to control mosquitoes is actually working or not. So this is sort of where my research journey begins. You know, I sort of stumbled into this interest in mosquito control um, from a scientific standpoint uh, when I joined my lab at Emory right out of undergrad to just sort of lead different surveillance projects that they were uh, doing in and around Atlanta. And these are just some pictures of all of the teams um, members that have been there since I was there. I ended up being at Emory between um, being a lab manager and a graduate student for about um, 10 years. So these are going to be a lot of busy plots, but before I started my um, who became my dissertation advisor, Gonzalo Vasquez Prokopec, published this spatial analysis using mosquito surveillance data on West Nile virus in Fulton County, which is the main county that encompasses the city of Atlanta. And what he found was that all of these metrics of risk really associated with a combined sewer overflow streams. So what these are, these are wastewater management systems. They're pretty ancient. They were sort of developed when cities first started being built, where to manage um, excess waste and precipitation runoff, cities essentially designated streams as dumping points for waste. So all the runoff in areas would be funneled into these catchments into natural streams to wash them out of the city. Um, as cities develop, they started building some facilities around these streams that would minimally treat um, in a sewage spillover event. So there's just maybe splash it with some chlorine or filter it through a large grate. Um, but sort of what this plot is showing here, the big takeaway here is these little triangles are where CSOs are. And you're seeing a lot of bubbles that spatially correlate to one another around these systems. So this is saying that mosquito abundance is really sort of somewhat spatially related to these facilities. The next bubbles that show up within this is that infection rates in mosquitoes are really sort of bubbling around these um, facilities. The third thing is that there's some association with um, dead bird reporting. Um, so if you remember when West Nile virus was first introduced into the United States, there were sort of massive bird die-offs across the country. There was big news. People were calling in, sending in birds. You know, what? why are all these dead birds around? And dead bird reports in Atlanta and Fulton County seem to really somewhat cluster around the facilities as well. And then finally, the fourth aspect of it is that at least here in the southern portion of Atlanta, this is these reds are clusters of human infections. So you're also seeing clustering of human cases near these CSO streams. So these CSO streams seem to jump out of us as like a really interesting place to do some research. And indeed, the year before I started, they had started doing sort of student-led surveillance of mosquito ecology and population dynamics in these streams. So we picked two streams. Um, here, I don't know if you're familiar with Atlanta, but this is where, um, man, I've already, uh, 75 and 85 meet. So Peachtree Street, if you know anything about Atlanta, there's a Peachtree Street that runs right through here, and this is where one of the facilities is. And then the non-CSO facility is right next to the Emory campus. And then this is sort of a map of where we were sampling in the CSO stream and the non-CSO stream. Um, and these are just some more spatial ideas of where they are. And you can see they're kind of the same. They're pretty rocky, um, pretty uh, disturbed. So the big thing about these CSOs that started unbeknownst to um, our lab, that we essentially found out, is that the EPA fined the city of Atlanta something like $4 billion for using a CSO system. And this is sometime, I think, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And so they were like, Atlanta, you need to fix this. So what they did is they built a massive underground sewage treatment facility to take all of the CSO water and put it into um, put it into treatment. So it's a storage tank that could hold the wastewater and then slowly release it into the actual treatment systems. And so essentially what that did is that eliminated these combined sewage overflow events in the CSO streams. 
So you can see in this graph right here, the year 2008, there were something like 160 CSO events. And then they completed the construction of this facility in 2008. And you can see in the years after that, almost zero. So it had a really big effect on the number of um, overflow events. Well, what we wanted to know is like, well, what did this do to the mosquito populations in these creeks? So here as sort of a brown line, we're looking at the number of larvae, the average number of larvae we found in our collection sites all in these creeks by month. Brown is the CSO, blue is the non-CSO. And you can see pre-remediation, this CSO stream is highly productive for mosquitoes. And once CSO stop, it looks just like a normal, quote unquote, normal urban stream where productivity is far lower than what it was when the stream was experiencing um, sewage events. So this is all in a publication that we did as I was a lab manager. And then sort of um, looking back on this for a presentation at the American Mosquito Control Association, we were in a symposium on trying to think about, well, you know, are all these things that we're doing to control mosquitoes actually a larvae, you know, impacting adults? And so what I have here is just our weekly collection. So in red are CSO pre collections and black is the non CSO. And these are just track collections, you know, and so do we see any real difference between um, what we're calling Culex species? So Culex are hard to identify and sometimes you just are lazy and you're like, it's a Culex and you put it and you count it. And, you know, we don't have quite the identification expertise that John and Tanya and the other um, seasonals have when doing um, mosquito surveillance. But so if we then look at what we could identify, the main vector of West Nile virus in Atlanta, so Culex fasciitis. Again, similar type of plot, sort of looking at collections. And then for another possible um, vector of West Nile virus in Atlanta that's more early in the season, you know, do their collections look different? And statistically, if we sort of account for repeated measures by year and week and, you know, control for the distribution of the data, it turns out there's really no difference in these collections between creeks. So you have this sort of, we're starting to see this outcome where, well, we've changed larval productivity, but we haven't made any impact on what we really care about, which is how many mosquitoes are out there that could bite us. So a similar type of plot here, if you know, we start thinking about, well, what about infected mosquitoes? You know, is that any different? Um, and you can see here, detecting virus is a fairly rare event. Um, it's the same type of plot. This is every week of collection, and the, each point is sort of an infection rate. And these sort of in this Culex species and then this Culex quinquefasciitis. Um, and again, the same takeaway here is that there isn't there isn't much we can say about the virus between a CSO and a non-CSO creek. You know, we could have the point where a lot of these collections we were doing came after remediation. So we don't really know what virus transmission looked like beforehand. Um, but even if we have eliminated the problem of larvae, we still have the problem of adults and infected adults. The one sort of interesting thing that I wanted to point out that went on with this work only so I can say that I did it is that in the winter in Georgia, which is not like winters here, we would actually physically go into these CSO facilities, into these large underground wastewater treatment facilities that handle sewage overflow. And here is a photo of some undergraduates looking for mosquitoes inside this facility, obviously not during an overflow event. Now we did take extreme precaution going in there. We had gas meters, so we tested the tunnels before we went in. We had oxygen meters in there with us to let us know if there were dips in oxygen. We could only go into these facilities if the chance of precipitation was less than 20%. Um, and a employee of you know, wastewater management was always there when we did this. Uh, but the whole point of this is to, you know, take collections into the facility to see if there's something about the facility. 
mainly what we were doing is trying to see if mosquitoes overwintered in these facilities. And I sort of wear this work as a point of pride because it was terrifying and extremely difficult to do. So it's hard to get an employee to show up to let you in half the time. Oftentimes these tunnels, I mean, they go under the entire city of Atlanta. You know, it starts at the headwater of the stream, which could be in the exact middle of downtown Atlanta. And so there's about a mile and a half of pipe that no one is going to walk through, you know, and it eventually starts getting to points where if you think of Shawshank Redemption. Um, and other parts about it too, I don't know if people have seen Dawn of the Dead remake in 2000. There's a scene they're in, um, they're in like a parking garage and there's a light in the far distance and there's zombies around. You can't see anything that's going on. And that's like what it felt like down there. And then they also have this heavy machinery up above you scraping and grinding and it sounds like the Tyrannosaurus Rex from Jurassic Park. So it was just sort of a bone chilling thing to do. And it turned out to give us almost no data. So we hardly found, this is sort of a graph of mosquito collections and virus isolations in these facilities. And by months, so January, February, March, April, into December. And really the big takeaway from this is that, well, mosquitoes are in these facilities when they're most active in the outdoors. So they weren't really an overwintering site for mosquitoes and we didn't really find any virus with them. Um, but really this was just all sort of part of our CSO um, research um, into sort of what happens when you change a major part of infrastructure um, for wastewater management in the city. So from this work um, came, spawned some of my dissertation work. So this actually sort of ha um, occurred by happenstance. I was really doing more sort of ecology and epidemiology focused research. Um, and trying to do these sort of applied experiments, um, but they all involve um, larviciding, and they, but they focused on sort of larviciding a different aspect of the environment. So focus on larviciding catch basins. And I have a graph of catch basins showing up in a, in a bit, but these are sort of where I was doing this research. And what I've shown, these are the maps of my sampling sites as part of my dissertation. These crosses represent trap sites, the circles are catch basins, and these sort of gray areas outline either a treatment zone or sort of a surveillance zone. And these sites are located within CSO catchment areas. And I doubt anyone remembers this map from earlier, but these two sites also happen to be within um, historical clusters of human West Nile virus infection prevalence. So I said catch basins, and in case you don't know, a catch basin is a physical device built either into or on the side of the road that allows egress of precipitation runoff or other runoff um, on a street um, and sort of guides it into um, either a sewer or a combined sewer system. And it's called a catch basin because it's built with a catchment. So water comes into the basin, it collects, once it gets to some sort of level, it spills over, drains into the sewage system. And this catchment is here to um, prevent debris um, from entering these um, precarious systems. As you can see here, this is what I call a catch basin selfie. I've opened the lid to the catch basin, and here's me, and I'm taking a photo of what it looks like. Um, and you can see that this is my chosen um, experimental environment. You know, I'm not working at a bench. I'm looking at the trash of society and catch basins and the mosquitoes that are in there. Well, the strategy behind why we're looking at catch basins is that I'm sure you can think of even if you just now think about well, what does the roads look like on my way home? They're everywhere. They're in every city. They're ubiquitous. Um, they all pretty much follow the same design in terms of how they're built. Um, and because they hold debris, this water is quite gross and polluted. And it's a really nice place for Culex mosquitoes, which are the primary vectors of West Nile virus, to lay their eggs. And sort of the main two classes of insecticide that are used to treat these catch basins are um, bacterial derived toxins. So like BTI, like beets, think BTI corn. Um, there are specific toxins from a certain species of BTI that kill mosquitoes. And then another one is methoprin, which is more of an insect growth regulator. 
what that does is when it's ingested by the larvae, it prevents them from emerging in, as an adult. Um, this is sort of an example of what methoprin looks like. Um, it's this briquette, and these are conveniently shaped to be fitted through the holes in the lid of a catch basin. So when you apply these things in the water, it kills the larvae, prevents them from emerging. And what I had been doing in my project was more ecological. I was looking at species distributions and applying insecticides to see if I could impact populations. You know, I was trying to think about the ecology of this virus, but essentially the simplest test of what I was doing was trying to see if I kill larvae, am I also killing adults? Right? So the summary of part of this work is you always want to check to make sure that the larvicide, the chemical that you're applying, the treatment you're applying is working. So larval control 100% worked. When we were using the bacterial, bacteria derived um, toxin, we were seeing up to 90% reductions in larval and pupil collections in treated basins compared to non-treated basins. And we're seeing a big difference in basin collections by where they were collected. So to just sort of talk you through these plots here. So this is for the methoprin toxin. So this prevents lar larvae from becoming adults. So we're looking at the proportion that unemerged. So these are the proportion of pupae that died. And in red are all of our treatment site collections and in black is all of our control site collections. Big takeaway here is that red is much higher than the black is. And then if you think about where these places were applied, Inman Park and Phoenix Park received no treatment, so they did not receive a larvicide, whereas Grant Park and Springville Park did. And we're seeing this is a significant difference in um, the inability of pupae to emerge. So the larval control worked. To sort of jump forward to the conclusion of this research, like I said before, what we want to know is did this impact infection rates in mosquitoes? So similar type of design, we're looking at the red line, which is the infection rate in treated sites, and the black line, which is infection rate in the untreated sites. So this is sort of a smooth curve between them. And while visually they look different, statistically they are not different. So from early on in my graduate research, I sort of left with this impression that, you know, larval control isn't really impacting the population as we would expect it to. Um, and when I interviewed here at CAES, I sort of brought up this result and talked about the surveillance system and different sites, you know, in Connecticut, is this something we could pursue here? And, you know, Ted and Phil um, seemed really excited and on board with it. And, you know, we sort of worked together to think about how we could, you know, evaluate larval control for West Nile virus um, more substantially. So my graduate level work is really more focused much on a much smaller scale. You know, those, those parks and areas really weren't that big. So can we think about doing the same type of research, but at a um, political level that's important? So what we decided on and, you know, um, ended up with is a comparison in terms of West Nile virus prevalence and intensity between two different towns in Connecticut. So it ended up being comparing Milford and Stratford. And the objective of this work was to evaluate the ability of larval control programs to reduce larvae and pupae in the catch basins, to reduce adult populations, and reduce prevalence of West Nile virus. So what I've shown you here in this map, you can sort of faintly see roads um, all throughout the area. These green dots are where CAES has trap sites. The red stars are where I have placed traps. And then all these black dots are catch basins within 500 meters of a trap. All right. And so some of these traps have gray around them. And now these are sites that I sampled catch basins and um, sampled adults. Whereas a site like this, um, while I've mapped the basins, I did not sample them. If you 
are familiar with Milford, this is right around the Connecticut Post Mall. So it's a pretty busy road. There's a lot of parking lots, a lot of areas that perhaps Milford has a record of as a catch basin, but are unlikely to treat. So in Milford, what makes Milford interesting is that they practice comprehensive larval control. So they have a fully funded operation where they hire an applicator to fully treat the town for mosquitoes. And so what that treatment program includes are biweekly treatments of tidal flood prone tidal sites and then just non-tidal flood prone sites. And they treat these sites every two weeks with um, a bacterial toxin larvicide. Um, they treat it from May to October. And then coupled with that for West Nile virus, they do about three seasonal treat, three rounds of treating of their catch basins where about 75,000 catch basins receive another um, bacterial toxin product. Um, and this typically occurs between June to August. So sort of as a foil to Milford is Stratford, which is right next door across the Hussitonic River. Um, and their sort of treatment program varies quite a bit. You know, they actually only, um, when I first started, I was under the impression that they did not treat, but apparently they do treat, but it's only once a year and it's only 5,000 basins and it's only when they have money. So, you know, we're sort of running into a theme of West Nile virus control research where money is a big factor here. So they don't have quite the amount of resources to really go all out on mosquito control. So briefly, just to show you, this is the um, insecticide that is used in both towns. The applicator actually does the treatment in both towns. Um, it is a Bacillus spiricus toxin or bacteria that elicits a toxin. And I see some questions here, you know, are these insecticides used to kill other insects? These toxins produced by this insecticide are actually very specific to mosquitoes. Um, but there might be other related species that um, are impacted by this, but you know, for the most part, these are really sort of um, marketed for mosquito control. And these sort of show you sort of what's the suggested application rate for different, you know, wastewater sites. And then this sort of recommendation of we'll use more if you want there to be residual activity. All right, so how did we design our research? Well, I showed you all those maps of, you know, catch basins around them. So what we first did is we um, once we chose our surveillance sites, we mapped all the catch base so we achieved um, received GIS files from each town and mapped out all the basins um, within 500 meters of a trap. Here's the trap location and this is the radius. You can see these little dots are a labeled basin. And what we did is we randomized the order of these basins and then evaluated them to establish a threshold of Every week we were gonna sample 10% of the basins in this circle. So we had to figure out what those 10% were. Um, our criteria were, you know, they have to have water um, and we have to be able to access them. In 2019, we physically removed the grate and sampled them ourselves. In 2020, because of COVID, we changed our methodology so that these basins could be sampled independently by just slipping something through the grate. So the other thing we did is we def tried to define efficacy. So beyond just comparing collections in a basin that was treated to a basin that wasn't treated, we took samples of the water. And what we did is we screened that water for mortality. What I mean is that CAES has colonies of mosquitoes. They have a Culex pipiens colony. And so we would take Culex pipiens larvae from colony and stick them in the water from a catch basin and see if they died after 24 hours. We also evaluated for the potential for resistance to the larvicide. So through collaborators at Cornell, um, who are also members of the Northeast Regional Center for Excellence in Vector-Borne Diseases, they have a pesticide resistance monitoring program where I submitted samples to them and they determined if those samples of mosquitoes from the field were resistant or not. We have virus surveillance which is setting out traps to collect mosquitoes. And then we tested those mosquitoes um, for virus. So, as I did for my graduate student work, we wanna know, we have to check to make sure the larvicide is actually working. 
So what I have here are bar plots of the proportion of sample basins that contained a fourth and star larvae, contained a mosquito larvae. And red is Milford, and gray is Stratford. Um, and really what you see here, where Milford, where there are much more treatment events, there were three treatment events, um, the first two weeks after the larvicide was applied, you can see a decline in this prevalence compared to um, time periods that we considered untreated. So either they occurred early in the summer before the program actually started, or they were beyond what we're considering the threshold of four weeks. So the larvicide theoretically should be active for up to four weeks in these catch basins. So we're assuming after four weeks, unless it's been retreated, that um, there's no longer an effect of the insecticide. If we look at the same type of plot, but the number of larvae collected in catch basins, again, you could see in Milford where there were much more application events, we're seeing a decline in about the first two weeks post-treatment. Um, you'll notice that these effect sizes are much more pronounced in Milford than they are in Stratford. Um, I think this is likely due just because there's just more weeks that can be that we can consider a treatment week in Milford than Stratford. And I'll show you why um, in the next couple of slides. In terms of pupae, so same type of plot again, except we're looking at the proportion of basin sample that contained a pupae. We're seeing a two week decline in Milford and a variable effect in Stratford. And finally, perhaps overkill, the average number of pupae collected in a basin, so actually counting the pupae. Um, it's tough to tell, <clears throat> but there is an effect of treatment. Um, but really what it is, is that overall, there were just fewer pupae in Milford in all across all basins than there were in Stratford. So this is why I think that even though in the plots before, we're not really seeing a strong effect size in Stratford, um, to me, that's an issue of sample size. So I said earlier about defining efficacy. So taking a water sample and screening Helix pipians larvae for mortality in that water. And that's exactly what these are. This is the estimated average mortality in all of the water samples tested. Red is Milford, gray is Stratford. And there's no difference in these bars between the towns. But what you see is that and those collections that happened the very first week after the larvicide was applied, we're seeing very high mortality, all right? And it occurred in both towns. So that means that when Stratford treated, it did, it was eliciting um, toxic effects on mosquitoes. And then in both towns, within a week, within two weeks of application, it's declined, but we're still seeing some level of um, control in the basins. So the big question, which has been the big question throughout this whole talk, is like, has it impacted adult collections? Well, my result is, to me, unshockingly different, not different, excuse me, it is not different from Atlanta. So here we have, I've shown some more of the average. So these are trap collections of Culex pipians, and it's very noisy because these are field collections. But overall, if you look at the red, which is Milford, and the gray, which is Stratford, collections tend to follow the same trend. They rise and fall together. And the same sort of occurs if you think about West Nile virus prevalence in the mosquitoes. So when one town has infected mosquitoes, the other town has infected mosquitoes at about the same prevalence. So these lines here show when catch basins were treated in each town. Um, this is something that we've included for um, our publication, but it just sort of gives you an idea of you know, when basins were treated. Um, as you can see in both Milford and Stratford, there are already treating basins when there are lots of adults already present in the environment. So we're not seeing any statistical difference between these collections of adults or of West Nile virus infection. So really, what are some positives to this? You know, it, I, I don't want this to be some some sob story of you know what we're doing isn't working. It's just more of like well we really need to you know evaluate it a little bit more. So one aspect that is um, sort of seems to be a positive is these difference in light trap collections between the two towns. So 
Light traps are a type of trap that really collects um, mosquitoes that are younger. They're looking to blood feed. You know, they they haven't come from very far. You know, they don't have the energy. Um, and you can see because Milford really practices this comprehensive larval control. You know, they're treating basin habitats, they're treating tidal habitats, they're treating flood prone habitats. That collections in these light traps are far below the average of collections in Stratford. So we are able to see an effect on um, adults when we think about it from this perspective of mosquito control. You can also, we have the suggestion that trap collections are somehow related to uh, metrics in catch basins. So here we have on the x-axis, the total number of pupae collected in that sort of zone around a trap and the number of adults in a trap within that zone. And this is a statistical prediction, this black line and gray shaded area. And believe it or not, it is a positive relationship and it is statistically significant. Um, whether we repeated this study and observed this again, that's for debate, but it certainly um, suggests this is something worth following up. OK, so where have I been with this research and where am I going? Well, so we know larval control works in catch basins. It kills larvae. It prevents the emergence of adults. What we're still struggling to show is that that level of control has any sort of impact on the West Nile virus in zootic cycle. You know, we still need more work to show that larval control can reduce adults and can reduce infection prevalence. So some of the applied outcomes that you know towns could think about from these results is that you know, there's always room for improvement. And I'm gonna call these operational improvements. We can improve the way that we distribute um, insecticides in the environment. So the first one I have here is define and treat hot spots. So what I mean by this is that all of these points, collections and catch basins are highly aggregated. So what this means is that there's a high degree of variance between collections across all um, catch basins. And so it could be worthwhile for a town to rather than uniformly treating all basins, you know, three times, you know, take a year, figure out where the real problem areas are and attack those areas. You know, you might be able to have more effect um, at a local scale that way than on just a uniform distribution. We can also think about the timing of when we're applying these um, insecticides. So we want to kill larvae. So we want to kill larvae when they're going to have the greatest impact on adult populations. So you can see here, this is just a graph of collections, but these dashed lines show you when catch basins were treated. All right. So there's already a standing mass of adults in the population when they're applying treatments right here. Whoops. So let's change those treatments to something that occur that is occurring here to something that's occurring here where there's not many adults and where controlling larvae is going to have a greater effect. Now there isn't there's theoretical data to support this. The actual physical data for it hasn't been done yet, but it's certainly worthy of trying. The other thing to think about too is, you know, if you have limited funds, spend them differently. So here I have a plot of um, nuisance mosquito collections in Milford and Stratford and the same theme. We have collections in red for Milford and collections in black for Stratford. And as you can see here, there's a pretty big spike of floodwater species in this one area in the town. And I can tell you anecdotally that around this time, people in this neighborhood that knew I was collecting mosquitoes were furious. You know, they were saying this is the worst summer it's ever been, you know, and I just didn't quite believe them because we didn't have the time to identify these mosquitoes yet. But at the end of the fall, when the season was over and John and Tanya and the other people could start identifying our collections, you know, it really jumped out to me. It's like, hey, these people aren't wrong. There were significantly more mosquitoes in this area than in other areas. And these weren't, you know, West Nile virus vectors. These are just the the mosquitoes that chase you inside and ruin your backyard barbecue. And so, you know, it and this was an area where the problem persisted into 2020. So, you know, 
if you only have so much money, you know, think about ways that you can implement it where it's going to have a greater overall impact. So in terms of my future career, what I would really like to go with this work is, you know, continue, you know, I'm not giving up on this yet. You know, now I'm sort of shifting my focus to is like, all right, well, what does it take to impact West Nile virus? Um, and one of the things that I think needs to be improved upon is that I think I'm collecting the wrong metric. So we're collecting mosquitoes that can fly around wherever they want. They can get the virus in different places. And just because I collect them at a site does not mean that that's where they got the virus. So what I'm talking about is implementing some sort of system, which is common in some states, where you use sentinel animals to track the virus. So this means having like cages of chickens that are just out um, and they're exposed to mosquitoes and you take blood from the chickens maybe once a week, every two weeks, and you test it for antibodies to West Nile virus. If you start with a flock that you know has no antibodies to West Nile virus, and through time you start picking up antibodies, you know that transmission actually occurred in that place. They got exposed, they cleared the infection, and they produced antibodies. Another reason to think about it from this standpoint is that it turns out calculating statistical power is a lot easier under this experimental design than another design. So beyond this too, Phil and I have been trying to um, develop different control strategies for other viruses, such as um, Triple E. We're all familiar with the outbreak that occurred in 2019. And we're working on some prelim data, um, different devices that we could use um, to impact these mosquitoes. And, um, the goal of this is part of my career goal is to really think about how we can expand um, impacts on systems beyond what we already know um, in our treatment um, plans. So with that, um, I think I went maybe a little long, but I was just excited to show you and thank you all for participating and that's my talk. Great, well, thank you, JR. Um, I think we have a little time for questions. You answered one question already during the talk, so I'm gonna to skip to question number two. To what extent is modification of the environment to make it less favorable for mosquito larvae compatible or not compatible with manage management of wetlands for other biological goals? Yeah, so I don't think anyone manages wetlands for mosquito control anymore. I think it's um, everyone that does it uses sort of a one health approach, um, environmental approach. So I think CT, um, the state of CT, where they do implement any sort of wetland um, control, it's really more about making the environment healthy for the environment um, with an added benefit that perhaps this improvement will make mosquito populations manageable. So allowing for more natural flow of water in and out of marshes, um, allowing fish in there, you know, getting rid of invasive species. So yeah, I mean, wetland management for mosquitoes is a very old idea and it's not really done anymore. Okay, question number three. Is the effect of aerial adulticiding altering human behavior and exposure to infectious mosquitoes or significantly reducing the mosquito population, limiting virus transmission? So um, it's both. I don't, so I, well, the human behavior thing is tough. That's never part of an actual um, retroactive study. Um, in terms of humans, what they're looking at is, um, neuroinvasive disease reported to hospitals. So these are people that are so sick that they show up to the hospital with West Nile virus, the system is not going to miss them. And so um, what that means is that what they're looking at neuroinvasive case rates before and active a treat after a treatment, and they're seeing a decline in a treated area and not a decline in an untreated area. There are also other operational publications that <clears throat> clearly show you spray a field with an adulticide and you compare mosquito collections pre and post collections, um, it goes down. So the problem with that 
mosquito aspect is that two weeks later, they're right back up. So it definitely, the assumption is that when they do the human data, it's killed mosquitoes and therefore prevented human infection. But, you know, I can, there are some interesting papers on human behavior that I could, um, it seems to be what's been done is more related to lifestyle, like areas of the country where you spend more time outside that are more rural actually seem to have higher population rates, possibly because they're just more at risk. Okay. Uh, question number four. So as I understand it, about five years ago, Connecticut became the only state in the country to ban the use of methoprene in coastal areas of the state which resulted in a de facto ban statewide, meaning no towns are currently using methoprene. During this period of time, mosquito-borne illness has risen. Should the Connecticut General Assembly consider removing this ban on methoprene to kill mosquito larvae? Also, is methoprene highly targeted insecticide that only kills mosquito larvae? Um. I don't know too much of the politics. I, I think the station is more familiar with why methoprene was banned. Um, but you are right. Connecticut is limited in its um, tools to use for um, mosquito control and catch basins. So there are some, not direct studies, but sort of if you compare efficacy of BTI versus methoprene and catch basins, methoprene seems to be a little bit more resistant to reduced efficacy in those environments. You know, it somehow isn't impacted as much by pollution. Um, whether or not the discontinuation of methoprene is the cause of um, greater mosquito-borne illness in Connecticut, uh, I couldn't really say much to. Um, I can tell you anecdotally, Based on my research in Atlanta, looking at infection curves in Atlanta and infection curves here in Connecticut, they look an awful lot like the same thing. Um, as Phil and I sort of discussed, West Nile virus seems to be happening on a much broader regional scale than we're imagining. You know, so it's not just like, well, that town has West Nile virus, so we should assume our town is the same. It's more of like what's happening in other states is likely happening in our state as well. And I think CDC has published um, case rates for um, vector-borne diseases in humans is up across the entire country um, in the last decade. So um, in terms of it being targeted, I do believe methoprene is fairly specific to mosquito larvae, but I have to double check the literature on that. Okay, and then the final question, uh, stormwater management is very important for sewer systems. Would flooding events affect applying the chemicals for mosquito control? And can we pack the mosquito control chemicals in a wastewater treatment unit on site? Well, so these CSOs were unique in that they literally dumped out wastewater into the streams. <laughs> it was minimally treated and um, when they fixed that, that creek wasn't a problem anymore. It didn't need larvicides um, in the water. Um, and based on how I understand wastewater treatment, like actual treatment facilities, um, that water isn't released back into a potable system. It's sort of released back into, you know, some sort of um, environment. Um, and I don't think they'd like it if we put chemicals in the outflow. Um, but um, stormwater management is certainly, in terms of the catch basins, can um, dilute toxins that are in the catch basins. So that's more of, you know, an outcome of precipitation events um, where thinking about um, if you treat an area, if you treat catch basins and then it rains, you probably need to go back and treat them again because all of the insecticide has been washed out. Um, whether you could think of a way to make it less likely to wash out could be something to think about for sure. Great. Well, well, thank you, JR. That was a wonderful talk. And um, if you have any further questions, um, feel free to reach out to JR directly. Um,
And um, thanks again for your attention.